for the third webinar in our Managing Neonicotinoids in Row Crop webinar series. <clears throat> Just gonna give it a second to get everyone <laughs> into the webinar and then we'll get started. We're lucky today to be joined by John Tucker, our entomologist from Penn State. Um, very well known for his work in crop pest and uh, row crops um, <laughs> with no-till and cover crops. So, <laughs> excuse me, John has come to Vermont before and spoken to us on this topic and uh, <laughs> has a lot of background and knowledge um, in pest management with these crops. Of <laughs> course, Oh, I'm going to get my water. All right. It looks like everybody's in, Susan, so far. All right. So again, welcome, everybody. Continuing our Neonic webinar series today. Um, just a couple of items to cover before we introduce today's speaker. Just want to quickly thank our sponsors for the webinar the USDA Crop Protection, Protection and Pest Management Program, as well as the EPA, um, and my team here at UVM, the Northwest Crops and Soils team, for providing us the resources to be able to put on this webinar series, and of course, our partner, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Hmm. There we go. Just a reminder that there's uh, three more webinars in our series next week will be joined by Cornell's IPM program, and they'll be visiting with us on integrated management that they've been doing in New York, focused on um, managing neonicotinoids. And then we'll also be joined um, on December 20th by with Reed Johnson talking about reducing bee exposure to these insecticides during planting. And then we'll wrap up the webinar series with myself and St Steve Duenell from the AIB, just taking questions, getting feedback, and talking about how we're going to move forward um, with neonic management and the recommendations uh, for future use. All right. There are CCA, CCA credit and pest applicator credit available today. The QR code will be put up at the end of the webinar. If you need a pesticide applicator credit, you can email Susan Brulette and um, she'll take care of that for you. But otherwise, we're going to get started. If you have questions, just put them into the chat and we'll um, answer those after John's finished with his presentation today. All right. So with that, I'd like to welcome John Tucker from Penn State. Again, he's the, um, I don't, are you the row crop entomologist specifically, John, or do you- Yeah, do I'm the field you, crop entomologist from Pennsylvania. Crop. Okay, field crops. All right, awesome. Well, you do a great job, John, <laughs> and thank you for everything that you do. It's just a ton of valuable information for everyone throughout our region and the innovations that um, you've been taking to really evaluate the impact um, of the control measures we use and how that actually affects crop production um, in different ways that maybe we haven't thought about before. So thank you and sure. um, I'll let you take it from here. All right, great. Thanks, Heather. So do you need to unshare your screen? So I, oh, there you go, you're one step ahead of me as usual. Okay. I should note that John said there's a wild Christmas party going on outside of his office. <laughs> and so if we start to hear jingle bells and ho ho hoing and I don't know what else, um, just ignore that and pay attention to John. <laughs> right. Yeah, our um, 
our holiday party is uh, starting at 1230 and um, people are starting to gather in the hallway out my, outside my office. So we will uh, we'll see. The party is not in my office. It just so happens my office is in proximity to the. To the oh, oh, OK, good. So I, I'm not that important. Around here. <laughs> but uh, Heather, thanks for the invitation. And I would far prefer to be in Vermont in person, um, but we'll deal with uh, Zoom today, um, as is the uh, series you're putting on. Um, I am an avid skier and try to get to Vermont when I when I can. But I, I understand there's already been some skiing up there. My son went to Killington a couple weekends ago and had a fantastic time. But anyway, okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, uh, row crop farming, cover crops, and IPM um, kind of used together to improve pest control. And neonics are just one component of this. So I'm not going to um, rail on neonics for... 50 minutes, but there will be a um, sort of sig significant portion of the talk that focuses on them and highlights some of their limitations and maybe a benefit or two. Um, but let me get started here. So I have uh, become accustomed to um, providing the, the take home message at, at the start, just so you can see what's coming and then we'll go over the content and then we'll kind of repeat this as most extension folks uh, kind of learn, you tell them what you're gonna tell them and you tell them and then you tell them what you told them, right? So the take home message are simply that um, no-till and cover crops can build diversity and actually improve pest control. Um, this is counterintuitive to some folks. Some folks assume that when you bring cover crops into a no-till system, that is just um, bringing trouble along, um, but our research is showing something different and other folks' research has shown something different. Um, and that diversity you can build with no-till and cover crops can improve crop production in, in more ways than one. Um, uh, integrated pest management is kind of the key to protecting that diversity that can be built through no-till and cover crops. And then pairing IPM with cover crops just kind of makes them more effective at what it is they can do. All right. Okay. So, uh, so we're all on the same page. Uh, integrated pest management um, is just using a combination of tactics to control pest populations. Specifically, we deal with biological, cultural, and chemical tactics. But importantly, that chemical tactic is usually the last resort. So if these other things don't work and we need to control a pest population, then we turn to an insecticide. Uh, and IPM was introduced by entomologists at the University of California, Riverside in 1959. So it's been around a long time, but there are two original justifications that made IPM different than what came before. And one was that they used uh, IPM to protect natural enemies. So by using IPM and not spraying insecticides on a calendar basis, for example, we can have more natural enemies in fields and those natural enemies become allies in pest control. So they can actually do some work for us. And the second piece of the puzzle is that uh, IPM introduced the idea of ensuring profitability when we're using pesticides. So if we want to use an insecticide, we want to make sure that it will pay off uh, economically when we use it. So taking into account the amount of insects or the amount of damage that are in a field that's occurring in a field um, and comparing that to the cost of the insecticide, the value of the crop will tell us if it ensures profitability. So kind of embedded in IPM are these kind of two pieces. Now we're going to protect natural enemies and we're going to ensure profitability. To implement IPM, it's relatively straightforward. So the first step is to avoid preventative insecticides, then scout to know what's in your fields. So understand if you have an economically damaging pest population, understand if you have any pests at all, just by walking fields regularly. If you do find pest populations, you can compare the populations you find in your fields to an economic threshold. Then you can control that population if it exceeds the economic threshold, okay? So those are kind of the key principles of IPM, and I hope you have those uh, in the back of your mind or probably been exposed to them before. So there's a lot of conversation among farmers and, um, uh, and folks that work with farmers about this idea of building soil health. And I'll uh, just mention it because it's key to a lot of folks approach these days and more and more people are kind of getting on board. And there's been a lot of messaging from the uh, USDA's NRCS and conservation districts and others about this idea. Um, and when I think of soil health, I just think of soil quality. A lot of people would give different definitions of soil health, but I think the core of it is soil quality. So if you want to build soil quality on a farm, uh, you want to, you'll farm with diversity and conservation in mind. And that usually starts with no-till, 
um, that moves um, to a, a uh, includes a, um, a more diverse rotation, which often includes cover crops. And I recognize that, um, that in Vermont, uh, using no-till might not be people's first inclination. As, uh, tillage um, for a lot of years has been primary up there because of soil um, temperatures in the spring. Um, but I, I guess I'll point out that Pennsylvania is a little bit different and perhaps um, you guys can learn a little bit from Pennsylvania farmers. Um, uh, yeah, but again, I just understand that a lot of Vermont is a little bit different. But anyway, if you farm with diversity and conservation in mind using these tactics, uh, you're gonna build soil life. And this is one of the goals, I guess, of the soil health movement is to um, build soil health and value the life in soil. But importantly, if you um, are building soil health, then you'll want to protect it. So that's, again, where integrated pest management can come in, because rather than spraying insecticides uh, annually or every June 1st or whatever the schedule would be, we're going to take a more cautious approach, scout our fields and just use insecticides as necessary. Right. So from a soil health perspective, then we're going to value the life that we're building in our fields and we're going to avoid using insecticides blindly. So to do that, we're going to scout to know if pests are problematic, um, and then doing so will help protect beneficial arthropods, including those natural enemies I've been talking about, as well as decomposers, which I'll touch upon briefly today. And again, use the insecticide as a last resort in a way to protect some of these good things that occur in fields. Okay, so just a, a little overview of Pennsylvania. Um, I know you guys, most of you guys are in Vermont. Some of you might be in New York State or elsewhere, but um, Pennsylvania is a no-till state, um, and I find it very valuable to work in a no-till state as a person interested in conservation from a different, a, a bunch of different angles. Working in conservation ag systems um, is very enjoyable, and it's kind of the standard down here. So about 75% of our large acreage crops um, are no-till. That is, they don't see plows um, very often, if ever. So it's continuous no-till. And this has a lot of clear benefits from decreasing the number of passes across the field, the amount of time you need to manage fields, but it has huge benefits for water infiltration and just holding on to, uh, holding on to soil. And that's why we do it, because we want to do no-till to protect um, the Chesapeake Bay um, from continuous input of sediment. So that's the main reason that most of Pennsylvania is in no-till, is to help protect the Chesapeake Bay. If we don't no-till, if we actually till, this is what will happen. And maybe you've seen this in your neck of the woods. There's a freshly tilled field that's getting a fair um, rainstorm on it. And then that gentleman's um, topsoil is just moving across the road. And that's not good for anyone. Certainly not good for that grower who wants as much topsoil on their field as possible. It's not near, it's not good for the, uh, the local stream, which is gonna take a serious hit in, uh, <laughs> Uh, when this mud gets to it, um, and then the life in that stream is going to suffer also. So we're doing no-till in Pennsylvania to avoid this. Um, and it's commonly acknowledged that no-till is the starting place for conservation. So the one of the first steps in conservation-based farming is to stop tilling. Um, and then what you'll get is this. So this is a soybean field that um, uh, was recently established, and it's following corn that was in the ground last year. Uh, and what you might see is trouble because that's a pretty complex habitat when you look at it close up. But what I see when I see that is it's habitat for natural enemies. So it's a more complex environment that includes plants, uh, detritus from the previous year, and various animals will find this attractive, right? And uh, particularly uh, if it attracts natural enemies, that's gonna be good for crop production. And then in Pennsylvania, a lot of farmers also uh, add cover crops. So cover crops do um, two things. One, they improve soil quality, but they also kind of lengthen the season and make that habitat more attractive earlier in the season and kind of later in the season. So it just allows natural enemies more time to grow in that field. And the goal of this conservation approach is to build a small local food web where you have a bunch of animals active in the fields, maybe not owls and dragonflies, but um, various animals will be in the field some of them might be attacking your plants, but then you'll have natural enemies around that'll help stop those animals from attacking your plants too much. So we wanna build a local food web um, by using conservation and IPM together. And if you think about um, animals that might colonize crop fields, some of the first that will get there are these ground beetles. And ground beetles have been called the lions of no-till fields. 
Um, that's in part because they have a strong influence on what succeeds there. Um, depending on the species, they can eat weed seeds, but they'll also eat um, pest species and other things that might be running around in your field, just innocuous species. Uh, and ground beetles are great because both um, life stages, both the larval stage shown here in the upper left and the adult stage are predaceous. So you can see a ground beetle, this large adult here, which is about an inch long. You can see the mandibles up front here. This, the mouth parts are out front. So if you have an animal with mouth parts out front, it's a pretty good idea that that's a predator. The subterranean larvae kind of burrows through the soil, much like um, a worm might. Uh, but you can see these kind of sickle-shaped mandibles that they have. Anything they run into, they'll try to eat. And in terms of their feeding preferences, they do really well on black cutworm, true armyworm, uh, wireworms, even white grubs, uh, and definitely slugs. So the more ground beetles you have in your fields, among other things, the kind of the fewer pests tend to be around. So a lot of our research is focused on these guys as kind of a indicator species of what's of what the community uh, looks like. Okay, let me take a quick detour um, into the woods. Um, our hunting season is just wrapping up here in Pennsylvania. I imagine yours in Vermont is ongoing. Um, but regardless, if you're a hunter, if you know hunters, um, you would hope that when they walk in the woods or they sit in the woods for a while, they'll eventually see some animals that they might be able to harvest for food. But what we see in Pennsylvania a lot of times is a complete absence of deer. But you know that they've been around because you see no regrowth in that understory. So this is kind of a grainy picture that just shows a typical forest in central Pennsylvania with absolutely no greenery in the understory. And while we don't see any deer, that certainly provides evidence that they've been around because there's nothing regrowing. And that's what deer do to um, the forest if there's too many of them, right? They um, strongly influence the regrowth of the forest, okay? And we know this in part because of pictures like this, and there should be plants growing there, but the deer keep browse, uh, browsing them off. But we also know it from experiments. Um, so here's a deer fence uh, in the woods, uh, and deer can access... Um, the land on one side of this fence, but not on the other side of the fence. And you can see the potential of the forest on the right-hand side of the fence uh, when deer are excluded. Okay, so this is a mechanical exclusion of deer. And you can see that there's nothing, very little growing where, you, where deer have access. There's kind of too many deer and they're too active. But what happens when we have predators in the, um, in the picture? And here's a map from a research study that came out a few years ago now of uh, northern Wisconsin. So northern Wisconsin is kind of unique in that there are wolf populations that remain there. And this map shows kind of the residency time of wolves in different parts of the uh, upper portion of Wisconsin. So the darker the color here, the longer wolves have inhabited that part of the woods, right? So the, the black, the dark black, Wolves have been around for at least 10 years in that in that part of northern Wisconsin, where the lighter gray or white wolves haven't been around very long at all. Right. And I don't want to get into the politics of wolves and all that, but just emphasize their wolves um, as predators can strongly influence plant regrowth. All right. So this is kind of a natural experiment that's been going on. And scientists, forest ecologists have been out there trying to understand what the influence of wolves is on the forest, kind of mediated through the deer. So, you know, wolves are around. Here's a picture of a wolf from this area on a game cam, and they, they're looking for deer. Um, and the more wolves there are, or the more present they are, the more skittish that animal is going to be, and the more that's going to hide. They can often smell the wolf. They can see evidence that the wolf has been around, and they're just more afraid. And when it comes to plant health, herbivores that are afraid are great. Like, we don't want as many around. Here are some grainy photos that I borrowed from this research paper. On the left-hand side is a, is a picture of the woods from an area where the deer browse kind of gleefully. Like predators haven't been around um, this part of the woods for very long, if at all. So you can see very little regrowth. If you look at the forest floor, there's not many green um, sprouts or sprigs that are coming up. And you, can't, and, and you can see lower on the trees that all these branches are kind of browsed off. The right-hand picture shows a forest where wolves have been around for a long time. So we're talking, you know, eight, nine, ten years. And so the deer in this part of the forest are skittish. They're worried that they might get eaten by a wolf. So they don't come out and eat freely. They kind of hide and they get a bite to eat where they can. And the forest is coming back kind of more 
healthily. And so this shows, this kind of principle and this natural experiment shows that predators can protect plant growth. So this is an extreme example from a forest. Uh, we're dealing with crop fields, so it's not quite the same, but it'd be great if we could take advantage of this in agriculture. And our research is showing that indeed we can. So we have found that strong predator populations can protect plants from pests. So the vertical axis here shows pest feeding damage in a proportion. So the, uh, so the one here means that all the plants have received insect uh, or, or slug damage and the zero means none has. And this figure show, uh, shows the relationship between a predator population, and these are spiders and beetles and predaceous bugs and the like, versus the amount of pest feeding damage on those crops. And you can see a nice negative relationship here. So when we have a large predator population, we get very little feeding damage. We have a low predator population, we get a high amount of feeding damage. So this is what we want to see in our agricultural fields, if we can foster a strong natural enemy population. Okay, so let's uh, address insecticides. So I see insecticides are a value, as a valuable tool, and they are a valuable tool. When you need them, you want to have them, okay? Um, but depending, uh, um, regardless of the type of insecticide, whether it's a leaf applied or a foliar insecticide, a soil applied insecticide, or a seed treatment, um, they tend to be overused. And this is historically true. From when the insecticides were kind of first broadly introduced to the United States just after World War II, the use rate of insecticide has gone up every year from then until now. So more and more insecticides are being used every year. It's kind of remarkable. Uh, even the introduction of the EPA and Silent Spring, that paused it a little bit, but it didn't slow it down. Or maybe it slowed it down a little bit, but it didn't stop it. And insecticide use continues to grow in our country. And that's in part because people market these things. So companies that sell insecticides market them to convince growers that they have value. This is, of course, a dated um, uh, image of advertising DDT. And look at the happy housewife and the happy apple and uh, potato and cow. Like, why wouldn't you want to use DDT if you could have an happy, happy potato or cow on your farm, right? Um, but this, um, this type of messaging continues today. Um, here is poncho. Um, the active ingredient of this is clothionidin, which we'll talk about a bit, but it's just a neonicotinoid seed coating. And you can see the advertisement there uh, that this is the seed treatment that little monsters fear. So Bear here is trying to scare you into using um, their seed treatment because this is a scary animal. So they show you a close-up of an animal, but it's not just a straightforward animal. It's actually been photoshopped. Right, and they're trying, they Photoshop it to scare you. So if you know anything about entomology and you know anything about aphids, so this is a green peach aphid. Green peach aphid's mouth part is this long stylet or proboscis right here. It sticks that into the plant and it sucks out juices. What some creative person has done here though is Photoshopped on a mouth with craggly teeth and a tongue. Well, I assure you that aphids don't have craggly teeth and they don't have a tongue. Uh, their mouth part is this long straw. So this has been photoshopped on there to scare farmers, to scare anyone who works in this world because you don't want this angry animal feeding on your crops. Okay, So just to point out that there is a, long, a, a strong effort in place to get farmers and others to adopt these types of technology. Okay, So we're not kind of unbiased when it comes to these things. We're being influenced by this type of advertisement. So as, again, I see insecticides as valuable tools. They tend to be overused and they're most effective. Insecticides are most effective when they're, being, when they're used via integrated pest management, okay? So that means we're gonna scout and we're only gonna use insecticides if their popu populations exceed economic thresholds. Because if we don't, we can have all kinds of unintended consequences, including we can decrease those good insects that we want in fields that can make kind of farming more difficult if we don't have good populations of them because pest populations can be worse in the absence of these natural enemies or um, e uh, kind of ecological functions can slow down if we don't have decomposers like decomposition doesn't go as fast. And then there are environmental concerns. Um, neonics are a water soluble insecticide. The more insecticides we use on our land that are water soluble, the more insecticides are gonna be in the nearby streams, lakes and rivers. That's just a fact of life. And this might not get much attention but I assure you that if you're using neonics um, and you have streams nearby, those that insecticide is getting to that water sometime during the year. 
So just emphasize that they tend to be overused, but there's no difference between a leaf applied, a soil applied, or a seed applied insecticide. They're all doing the same thing and they can all have non-target effects, okay? And to provide some evidence that insecticide use is um, intensifying, uh, it's intensifying whether you're spraying it or whether you're applying it to seeds. And I'll provide examples of both. And unfortunately, a lot of this use is unnecessary. Uh, here's bifenthrin, which is an extraordinarily popular uh, pyrethroid insecticide. And this is the amount of use from 1992 to 2017. You can see the amount being used goes up. The vertical axis here is the estimated use in millions of pounds over time and the different colors of the different crops, right? The amount of uh, insecticide be uh, bifenthrin being used in corn really increased in 2012, uh, and that had an um, association with kind of the ethanol boom. So people are protecting their crop more. But you can see that the green portion, which is soybeans, that has been increasing recently. Um, and this is frustrating because soybeans are so good at resisting damage that insecticides are really unnecessary in soybean production. So this isn't Pennsylvania specific or Vermont specific, this is a national trend. And some of these crops aren't grown in either state, but just shows you that here's an intensification of a very popular pyrethroid. And this is what a um, US Geological Survey map shows for the amount of bifenthrin used in 1999 across the country. That's the amount used in 2017. Uh, so it's really intensifying. It's interesting that Vermont remains white, Pennsylvania um, changes a little bit. There's back to 99 and there's 2017. Pennsylvania gets covered in, must not be collecting information from uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Uh, and let's think about clothionidin. So again, clothionidin is one of the neonics that's commonly coated on seeds. It's most common on corn. So this figure shows the estimated use on the vertical axis over time. Um, and you can see neonics, uh, this clothionidin was introduced to corn and that yellow means corn, by the way. Um, introduced to corn in 2004 and for 11 years was, was very popular, right? So, and after 2014, the population or the amount being used seems to go away. And that's because the USDA and the US Geological Survey stopped collecting these data. <laughs> so this figure is from the US Geological Survey. It's not because people stopped using both iron and on corn seed, it's because the US Geological Survey stopped collecting these data. But if you consider the use pattern of Neonex overall, there's no indication that this drop is meaningful, right? It, there's only an acceleration of use. So this is the amount of neonics being used on a vertical axis again over time, but these are all neonics, including the stuff that's sprayed and, and the other active ingredients that are coated on seeds. And you can see it's kind of dominated by corn and soybeans and then some other crops, but there's no reason to believe that this adoption um, rate has slowed down. So this, this um, decrease evident from 2015 through 2019 is only because they stopped collecting data, not because neonics aren't being coated on seeds. And this is what the amount of clothionidin in the country looks like. This is 2003, so none was used. It was introduced in 2004. Uh, there it is in 2011. Oh, went the wrong way, sorry. That's 2011. And there's 2014, and the last year these data were collected. And there you can see uh, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, and Maine have some uh, some representation. It's interesting. You can see the Adirondack Park there in uh, in New York State. I hadn't noticed that before. Interesting. Okay, so just more evidence that a lot of um, insecticides are being used. It's not just the seed coatings. There's this general intensification of insecticide use across the country. Uh, and a few words about the neonics, we'll focus on them here briefly for a little bit, is that they certainly can protect yield, but the pest needs to be present, and that's often not the case. Um, they are coated on seeds, and because they are water-soluble, when that seed's put into the soil, capillary action pulls it out into the soil, and then when the plant starts to grow, the insecticide is taken up systemically. So it has this systemic activity. And it's super toxic uh, to insects. It's among the most toxic insecticides that have ever been developed for killing insects. And in corn and soybeans, these are the insects that are being targeted uh, by these neonic seed coatings. In corn, there's a list there, and in soybeans, there's a list there. I'm not gonna go over each individual one, but the ones that are underlined, say seed corn maggot, wireworm, uh, bean leaf beetle, are the ones uh, where they do particularly well, okay? Uh, the ones in parentheses are where they do particularly poorly, like black cutworm, for example, about 70% of black cutworms actually survive their interaction with neonics while they're cutting off plants when, corns are, when corn plants are young. 
Um, so something about the cutting behavior seems to make the insecticide ineffective. Okay. But I should point out that these are secondary pests. So the item, the, uh, the species or the groups on this list are the secondary concern of farmers. They're not the primary concern. So you don't see, um, uh, geez, I just had a brain fart. Sorry, you don't see uh, European corn borer on this list. You don't see armyworm on this list. Uh, you don't see uh, Western corn rootworm on the list. Things that corn growers are really worried about. These are secondary pests that the neonics are targeting. And just to put a picture on where these insecticides end up, if we put clothionidin on seeds and then we plant it, some is lost as dust, some is taken up by plants, but a lot of it gets to uh, nearby waterways or goes into field edges where um, non-target plants will take them up and then it just can cause a mess in the, in the ecosystem. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty picture I wanted to share, They're emphasizing that neonics go elsewhere besides where you put them. Again, they're very water soluble and they tend to flow downhill. And in my hands in central Pennsylvania, this is what I tend to see. This is the yield benefit, or this is yield of soybeans on the left and corn on the right um, for an uncoated seed and then a seed coat in red. So the uncoated seed is in green, and we see more or less identical yield both in soybeans and corn across the years when we've done this. We've done this you know, a dozen times at least, and we've never seen a yield benefit um, to using a neonix. And that's, again, not because the insecticides don't kill insects. It's because the insects that we're targeting are rare. They're occasional pests that don't colonize every field. Okay. Uh, and let's go to Ontario for a moment. So uh, some colleagues in Ontario at the University of Guelph has done, have done some excellent work. They did a long-term field experiment um, over a bunch of farms where they compared neonic and um, neonic coated seeds and non-coated seeds um, and, and, and try to examine what they're controlling and the yield benefits and the production benefits of that. So if you haven't been to Southwest Ontario, right up next to Michigan, it's very similar to the Midwest. Uh, it has kind of features of the Midwest and Pennsylvania all rolled together. It's a flat part of the world. They grow a lot of corn, soybeans and wheat and alfalfa. It's more or less like Pennsylvania, but flatter. So these colleagues um, did a large experiment um, and these data show their results. So what we have here is a, a few dependent variables. This N is our sample size. So the 145 means that they had 145 fields across a bunch of different farms. So might be 120 farms, might be 110 farms, I don't know, but they had 145 fields, which is a huge experimental effort, okay? And the FST is fungicidal seed treatment, and NST is the neonicotinoid seed treatment. So the neonicotinoid seed treatment has the fungicide in it, but the insecticide too. So the only difference between this right-hand column and this central column is that one has the neonic, but both has the fun have the fungicide. So if you look at the corn, uh, corn comparison here, for stand establishment and really young corn, so the VE to the V1 stage, then they quantified below ground injury, above ground injury from insects, and yield across all these fields. And you can see there's more or less no difference. So statistically speaking, there's no difference between the number of plants per square meter, the amount of below ground injury from insects, or the above ground uh, injury from insects. These numbers are statistically equivalent. Okay, You can see that they're very close to each other, but there's no clear advantage to having the insecticide in the system. And further, they also quantified the number of insects they could find. So here we have wireworms, the number per square meter, or the number of white grubs, um, and the number of is almost, almost a square meter. Um, and you can see those numbers are more or less equivalent. So the insecticide isn't really controlling anything. Like the wireworm numbers are equivalent, the white grub numbers are equivalent. I'm gonna stop uh, my kind of review of these results here, but know that this paper also has um, results for V3 to V4 stage corn and also for soybeans. And the story is very much the same. The neonicotinoid does not provide much of advantage. In fact, they found that only five to 8% of fields see a, a yield advantage from use, using neonicotinoids. And again, the reason is that the insects that are being targeted are uncommon. They're secondary pests. Okay. Um, now, as I started speaking today, we started talking about soil quality, and a good quality soil has a lot of 
kind of functions happening in it. Uh, and these data are from a colleague at Cornell named Kyle Wickings. Kyle is a turf entomologist. So these data are from a turf system. So they're a little bit different, but we've had this kind of the same effort kind of collaborating with, uh, with Kyle going on in corn and soybeans. Um, and I would think the data are very similar, but this is from turf. And this is a, called a spider plot. And each one of these axes is quantifying something we want happening in our field. So we want a lot of decomposers of different sizes, whether macro decomposers or uh, meso um, decomposers. We want a lot of diversity of things, whether it's um, predator diversity or enzyme pathogens or uh, mycorrhizal fungi or decomposers. So the bigger the number on each of these axes, the better. And the different colors show you different amounts of insecticide. So none, a low amount, a medium amount, or a high amount. If you just look at the two extremes, the green polygon seems to describe the largest area. So we're getting to the largest area when we're not, and that means the largest amount of function when we're not using any insecticides. But as you add insecticides from low, medium to high, look at that red polygon. So then we have the lowest amount of function where we're using the most insecticide, okay? which means that insecticides are disrupting all these good things we wanna happen in soil. Some more than others. If you look at this macro decomposer density, it doesn't seem to be being influenced at all, right? But on average, we get less soil functioning when we have insecticides going into the system. And this is um, part of that puzzle. So um, we've asked uh, in research experiments, do neonics exacerbate slug populations? because we've seen the pattern. So in this figure shows the number of slugs on a vertical axis over time on the horizontal axis. And slugs are a pest in Pennsylvania field crops because we have stable fields. They're no-till fields, right? It's a stable habitat and we get enough rain to make slugs happy. So slugs are herbivores. Well, heck, they can be anything. They can also be detritivores. They can also be predators, <laughs> but for the most part, they're herbivores feeding on plants. And this figure shows in red, that the average number of slugs where we have um, corn growing in a field that was planted with a coated seed, so an insecticide coated seed. So the neonics are in the fields that are represented by the red line. The blue line is a naked seed, so an untreated seed. So the T means treated, the U means untreated. And the difference between the red and the blue line is the number of slugs where we're using insecticides where we're not. And what's responsible for that difference in the red line and the blue line is the number of predators in these fields. Okay, and here are a few more data, and these are from um, this is from a soybean experiment. The previous figure was from a corn experiment, but then this figure from um, soybeans, we find that more slugs lead to fewer soybean plants. Not too surprising. So the vertical axis here is soybean plants, horizontal axis is slugs. So the more slugs we have in our traps, and we use little shingles to trap for slugs, either white roofing shingles that we cut up and put in fields. Number of slugs that gather under them is greater. We have fewer soybean plants per acre, but slugs are harder on soybeans where we're using these insecticide treated seed. Those are the black dots. So that's where the neonicotinoid is. And then when we have more slug predators, we get more predation. Okay, so that makes sense. So predation here is on the vertical axis and the bigger the number, the better. This is a proportion. So the proportion killed means that we take little caterpillars, which shown in this figure, whoop, 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 whoop. here we go. These little caterpillars that we sacrifice, we put a pin through them and we hold them to the ground and we wait for something to come and eat them. Um, so that's what predation means. The more these caterpillars are being removed, the better. And we compare that to slug predators per trap. The trap for slug predators, we, we sink a cup into the ground and the predators will just fall into them and we can count them. So as the number of slug predators in these trap goes up, the amount of predation goes up, but you can see it's limited by the presence of the insecticide. Where we have the insecticide, on average, we have fewer slug predators and less predation. Uh, and where we have more predators, we get fewer slugs, okay? So uh, here again is that predation number. So the bigger the number, the better. And here we have slugs under our shingles. So as that amount of predation on our little caterpillars goes up, the number of slugs per trap comes down. And notice the color of the dots. Where we have the insecticides, we have less predation and more slugs. And this interaction is happening because slugs are mollusks, right? They're not insects. To kill a mollusk, you should use a molluscicide. To kill an insect, you should use an insecticide. So here's an example of a water-soluble insecticide that's being ingested by a slug, but it's not influencing it. But then when a ground beetle or another predator attacks that slug, 
it gets a dose of the insecticide because the insecticide is in the slug. So that's what's happening here. So these insecticides are disrupting our natural control. If we didn't have these insecticides, the predators would be more successful. And this is an, uh, an interaction that's unique to our systems here in Pennsylvania. These data are from Australia, where they also have slugs in some fields. And this shows that a broadcast application of insecticide has a similar effect. So it's killing slug predators, so the slugs are more abundant. So here on the vertical axis is slug abundance over time and different treatments, but the purple treatment is chlorpyrifos, also called Lors band, which has been kind of yo-yoing in and out of regulatory status in the United States for a few years now. Um, but if we're using Lors band, uh, chlorpyrifos, we get more slugs, uh, oops, not fewer slugs <laughs> because the predators are being killed. So that's the same mechanism of natural enemies being uh, taken out and that's giving slugs the upper hand. So it's not something particular to seed coatings, it can happen with other types of insecticides also, but it happens in seed coatings because they're water soluble. Another detail um, that we, we found that um, the seed coatings, these neonicotinoids also limit uh, decomposition. Uh, we found this in a three-year experiment. So scientists can study decomposition by just taking your average residue that you can find in a crop field and just putting it in a mesh bag, weighing it before you put it out and then pulling those bags in and weighing them. So we have like a thousand bags in a field and we slowly bring the bag in and weigh them with time. So this is what kind of uh, decomposed straw looks like. This is kind of fresh yellow straw and this is decomposed brown straw. But we found that over th after three years, uh, we find a 10% slower decomposition rate where we're using an insecticide, either a pyrethroid, which is denoted by this LC, so that's lambda cyhalothrin, which is also called warrior, and there's a bunch of generic forms of it, or we're using the seed treatment. So we have 10% slower decomposition um, where we're using the seed coating, and the blue line shows an untreated field. So that's where decomposition is happening at a, a kind of a normal speed, and that speed is being delayed by these insecticides, and that's delayed because we have fewer springtails. Springtails, also called calembolins, are key in decreasing residue. So they'll feed, they feed on uh, fungi. Those fungi are decreasing uh, or kind of decomposing that residue. If you have fewer fungi around, you have, uh, sorry, if you have fewer springtails around, you have fewer fungi, you have fewer fungi, um, you have slower decomposition. So this is a fungal influence um, mediated uh, by this uh, springtail, which is a which is a rel relative of insects, so we get slower decomposition where we're using insecticides. And here's a more extreme example, an example where where insecticides can influence soil quality. So if you've ever been to a no-till field day, um, a demonstration up front is also that they'll take a clod of no-till soil and they'll take a clod of tilled soil and they'll put it in water. So that's what you have here. These are just different um, containers of water. And on the left, we have a no-till soil. On the right, we have a tilled soil. You can see that tilled soil breaks down awfully quickly as soon as you put it into water because it doesn't have as much aggregates uh, or things aggregating the soil pieces together. So that soil aggregate stability can be uh, measured this way. Um, and we found that soil aggregate stability can be increased by cover crops. So we did an experiment for three years and we had uh, control uh, treatment and an IPM treatment. In this case, we've confined that into one treatment because we didn't use insecticides um, uh, at all. So this is just one combined treatment. You can see uh, encouragingly that the cover crop increases the amount of soil aggregate stability. That's great. But if we compare that to a preventative pest management approach, so that has the seed coating and now we're putting a pyrethroid after planting, uh, where we use the cover crop, we detected a drop in soil aggregate stability, okay? So uh, those insecticides seem to be decreasing soil aggregate stability. And we believe uh, we need to do more work to figure this out for certain, but we have good evidence that it's, it's be, again mediated by these columbolins because you have fewer columbolins moving around less fungi, then we have less fungi germinating, we have less soil aggregate stability. So these preventative pest management approaches can have kind of knock on effects, whether you're talking about predators or decomposition. Okay, so the bottom line for me is uh, that we want to manage for the pests that we have and our farming goals. So if slugs are our biggest pest, or we don't have pests, then the insecticide is either causing us harm or it's not doing anything for us. 
So preventative insecticides can make your pest populations worse, but they can also disrupt this kind of natural functioning that we want to promote, whether it's pest control or decomposition or soil aggregation and other measures of soil quality. And these are only the few of the things that we've tried to measure and we found a negative influence on them. So I'm certain that there are other effects happening in fields. We just need to take a closer look. Okay, so let me finish up by just then pro providing the opposite side of the coin and providing some evidence that this approach works. So at Penn State for a long time now, we've had the Diversified Dairy Cropping Systems Project kind of ongoing. We're in our, we just finished our 13th or 14th year of this. So it's a long-term cropping experiment that's been funded by the SARE project. It's been funded by the, uh, by the USDA LTAR projects. So this is a um, kind of a comparison between two different types of rotation. We have a simple corn soybean rotation that's just a two year rotation with no cover crops, or we have longer rotations that are more diverse. They might have alfalfa or small grains in them and, they are, and, and cover crops. From an insect and slug management perspective, we're taking two different approaches in these kind of high diversity rotations, we're using IPM and the low diversity kind of high input rotation, we're using BT corn seed. We have seed treatments on both the corn and the soy, and we're using a broadcast pyrethroid shortly after planting. And not surprisingly, our pest populations have been worse in this simpler rotation that doesn't include cover crops and uses regular insecticide use. And that's being driven by our natural enemy populations. So the vertical axis here is the number of slug predators in our traps. Again, these are pitfall traps. And then we have six panels representing the first six years of the project. Um, I, I have work to do to get uh, the seventh through the 13th year of data out, but uh, that's my problem, not yours. And the gray dots are this high input, low diversity system, and the black dots are the low input, high diversity system. And you can see in the first three years, those predator populations were equivalent. But in the fourth, fifth, and sixth year, the predator populations where we're using fewer insecticides and we're using IPM starts to grow. Okay, And that can be a good thing because then those predators will protect our plants from damage. And that's what we see here. And this is the same figure I showed you after I talked to you about wolves. So we have slug damage on the vertical axis um, and early season predators on the horizontal axis. As the predator populations increase, the amount of slug damage to plants comes down. Okay. We've also done a recent three-year experiment where we kind of compared the value of having a cover crop um, for pest control. Um, and we found that these cover crops can help build predator populations. And here are a glimpse of the data. So this shows the amount of ground beetle activity or carabid beetles uh, on the vertical axis versus cover crop biomass. So the amount, the more biomass we had in that field, the more carabids that we found in those fields, which is great. And then that benefited pest control. So this shows the amount of white grubs um, in our fields compared to the amount of biomass. So as that biomass increased, the number of white grubs went down. Right? And that's not because white grubs are negatively influenced by the cover crop, it's because of the predators. So the biomass increases the predators, the predators then can control white grub populations. Okay? And then let's quickly, let me tell you, uh, tell you about an extreme case of using cover crops as pest control. And I don't expect a lot of people to adopt this, but just show there's other benefits you might not think of. Um, so a long time ago, I visited a good friend and colleague here down in Pennsylvania, a farmer named Lucas Criswell where this is one of his barley fields being eaten by slugs. And he asked, asked me what we could do about this. And I was you know, sitting there trying to come up with a response to him. And then he made the observation that if a slug wants to eat something green, the only option in that field is the barley he's trying to grow. So that comment was the basis of a project that I then got funded for and collaborated with Lucas on. And we did this at our research farm and that's shown here and also at, in his fields where we just put cereal rye between the row of either soybeans or corn. This figure shows in the front here, soybeans, cereal rye, soybeans, cereal rye, which we both established in the spring in a single pass. And off to the left and off to the right, you can see, see soybeans without anything between the row. All right, so we wanted to see what the benefit of having something else out there with the soybeans was. And those data were pretty clear. Right? So this is a, a slug rating on the vertical axis where we have no rye between the row and where we have rye between the row. Um, and you can see we have significantly less slug damage when we have rye between the soybean plants. So the, having the rye there is giving the slug something else to feed upon. It's having the amount of damage, more or less. But when we look at the number of ground beetles, the ground beetles were really attracted to that interseeded crop, right? So this is the number of individuals of ground beetles where we have no rye, where we have rye between the rows. So that's a tripling 
and the number of ground beetles when we have something between the rows. And that seems promising. So maybe we can put something between the rows to provide a benefit. Well, Lucas is a regular cover crop user. So he establishes cover crop like everybody else does in the fall. So this next year, he establishes cover crop in the fall, but he left 30 inch spacing. So he could then come plant into the spacing in the spring. So this is him planting the following spring. And more or less this cover crop is performing the same function that that um, zero rye did in the previous slide where we did that experiment in the spring. And this worked so well, and he had so little slug damage that then he started planting right into a standing green cover crop. And he enjoys doing this because the soil's over, he's covered, he doesn't have any erosion, he is increasing the organic content of his soil, he's uh, fostering biodiversity, but he's committed to IPM. So he has a scallop that covers his acres every uh, seven to 10 days, and they'll see if, say, army worm shows up. Um, other people will plant green these days by having a roller crimper on the front of their tractor and then planting behind the tractor. Um, Lucas um, invested in getting rollers on the front of his Kinsey planter here. So imagine the, the planters coming at you. Each one of these row units has a, a kind of integrated roller that's, that's laying down the cover crop um, as it moves. And this is what it looks like uh, in the end. Uh, and this um, thatch that is laid down provides three benefits. One, it provides great habitat for those natural enemies. Two, it's providing really nice kind of weed control. But three, it's also providing an alternative food source for those slugs, okay? So by not using insecticides, we allow those natural enemies to help control slugs, but the slugs are also being in, kind of intentionally distracted by this cover crop. And then one to seven days after planting, he'll come through with glyphosate and this cover crop will slowly die. Right? And so you can plant green like this uh, using rollers or not using rollers. Those are the benefits in the upper right hand corner that Lucas sees from doing this rolling. Okay. Hey, John, we have hey. a few, we have maybe five minutes left. Yep, so. I'm just about done here. Awesome. Thank questions. you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. And then um, I'll skip that. And so we're doing research now to understand how this is happening. Um, and we're founding that indeed our. Um, anecdotal evidence is being borne out by our data. So in this figure, we have bare ground, so no cover crops. We have brown cover crops that were killed three weeks before planting, and we have green. And this is the average number of slugs in those plots, and we tend to have more slugs where we're not using a cover crop, and that's driven by the natural enemies. And this is the number of slugs on the vertical axis. Number of slugs is highest, where we have a, a insecticide coated on the seed and with no cover crop, and our lowest amount of slugs is where we're planting green. We have no insecticide on the scene, right? And so farmers that do this, um, you can see uh, a yield drag if they don't know what they're doing, but the more a farmer practices this and talks to other people to do it, the, the yield difference actually kind of goes away. So this is called planting green. Sometimes it's called planting pink. So here's a crimson clover field from Western Maryland. The guy's doing the same thing. Um, uh, and so it, it seems to be effective for controlling slugs, but it has to be paired with IPM. Okay, I'll skip that. And there's my take home messages and Heather, I'll stop yelling at people and try to take a question. Yeah, no, it was great. Thank you. Just mm -hmm. so much good information. We really appreciate it. I like planning pink. I've never <laughs> seen that before. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a pretty picture. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody has questions for John, we've got a little bit of time for questions and um you had mentioned John, so get get it in the chat. I was gonna ask a question myself, but one of the things you were talking about was um, not much no-till in Vermont, and I think you know that has really changed since the last time you were here. So oh, maybe you had something to do with that. I don't know, but <laughs> I, I doubt you it. have um, quite a lot of no-till now, and a really strong, you know, since we've had many farmers now that have been successful in many years with our no-till cover crop conference, there are, there are a lot of people that um, are utilizing no-till. So it's been a really exciting transition and more farmers every year um, adopting the practice. So that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, okay. um, I see Aaron has a question. Um, he says there were less slugs with cover crops and no insecticide, but they were still there. How much damage did they do? 
Yeah, so I don't have a specific number for you, Aaron, but they're certainly causing less damage and they're being eaten more by the um, by the predators. So they don't have the same influence on the crop. So we we see less damage on the slugs. There are still slugs there. And in, in our minds, uh, those slugs are food, right? So you, you're not going to have natural enemies unless there's something to eat. So having some slugs is kind of necessary or, or, or other prey items is necessary to keep those predator populations kind of happy. Um, but how much damage they do, I can just say they're, they're doing less where we're using cover crops and IPM. Um, I know we've had, um, I think the last time you were here, you definitely influenced a few people to get rid of the seed insecticide. Well, didn't we have an army worm outbreak or something, you know, that next year? And boy, that that was the end of that. So um, any, I mean, I think, as you said, you got to be scouting, like the chance of that exists, but. Yeah, so yeah, so this is a, um, using IPM and, and less insecticides is a more management intensive approach. So you need more eyes on the field, not less. But just to address that armyworm concern, uh, notably, the, uh, the seed applied insecticide isn't going to do anything against those armyworms, or, or very, very little. Um, so the only way to stop them anyway is to scout, find them, and then apply the insecticide. I think there's only one of the transgenic traits on the market in corn that can slow down armyworm. So a good approach would be to, if that's a concern, is to find that trait, buy that trait, ask for it on an uncoated seed and then scout because the insecticide is unlikely to be helping in that situation, right? But that, that, this is how IPM works, right? We scout, right. we find the pest population, we do something about it. Um, Emily had a question about uh, the slower decompo decomposition related to insecticide applications was observed with plant litter. Would yep. you expect similar impacts um, on decomposition rates of other organic materials applied to fields like manure, as an example. Yeah, uh, that's right, Emily. We uh, we measured that decomposition using um, straw. I think it was rye straw. Um, but I would expect the decomposition rate to be um, similarly slowed by uh, in, in insecticide treated seeds because of the mechanism. Uh, in our view, the mechanism is that there's fewer colemblins around, and if the colemblins aren't moving as much fungus around, then things are going to decompose more slowly. I suppose with something like manure, um, that the main decomposer of manure might be flies, um, and if flies aren't exposed to insecticides in the same way, maybe that wouldn't be as influential, but my guess is that it would be. Um, but yeah, we haven't done this with um, manure. In, in fact, it is the case that manure kind of lends itself to having more slugs in those fields. So manure fields tend to see more slugs, but in our work, and we've done some um, experiments with manure, which is great fun, but you can find um, more ground beetles and more predators generally where you have manures because you have a better kind of food web there. You have kind of more things feeding on the manure and that's gonna promote or, or allow more animals to be in the field feeding on those things, feeding on the manure. So I, I would expect some influence, but maybe it would be diluted in the case of like a, a really wet manure or, or a manure that has not as much uh, plant residue in it, like, like cow manure might have. Right, that's a good point. Hmm. Um, I just wanna share the QR code for the CCA credits before we run out of time. And if there's, Maybe one last question for John before he heads out for the holiday gathering. Yeah. Has <laughs> been too loud here. No, no, they're not too rowdy. <laughs> um, we can definitely answer that. But I think I think that was everything. Um, John, it was great. Um just really great information i hope we can get you back here i'm gonna check in earlier with you next year so we can set our date <laughs> around the all the penn state programming because um, yep. you know you've had such an influence here with the data that you've been collecting and um just especially now with so much conversation 
around um, seed treatments, insecticidal seed treatments. We are not spraying pyrethrins on our crops um, at this point, but you know, these things, they sometimes rear their head up here. <laughs> um, so the seed treatment's the big one for us. And now that you're showing these impacts on soil health too, which farmers, the farmers here are really into. And um, so I think that's important for them to hear. Okay, good. Well, I'm happy to share. Yep. Yeah, hopefully next year. Okay. okay. Well, with that, everyone, thank you again for participating. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone next week for the rest of the webinars. Thanks, John. Happy right, holidays. Thanks. thanks for listening. Happy, happy holidays to you as well. Okay, bye okay. now.